to Anne and everyone else. Uh, interesting, informative, stimulating, and maybe enraging enough to raise a hand and say, really? Um, uh, I, I do hope uh, we, we, we together find this an interesting kickoff to some uh, discussions. So uh, because Melissa has done such a good job of introducing the context for this, I'm going to skip right ahead to my own role of talking about science and religion itself. Um, let me just say right now that if you are a young person from the medical world, I do hope you picked up one of the contact us forms, and I will urge you later to, to fill it out. Um, so my topic today is wonder and how it opens up the engagement between science and religion. As Melissa explained to you, I am a practicing scientist, and I've been blessed to have a few moments where I had a genuine frisson, if that's the word, of, of wonder. And I want to share one of them with you as a way of uh, getting us into the discussion of wonder as a bridge between science and religion. Um, I am showing you here, do we have a stick? If not, excuse me one second. I brought a laser pointer and that will help at this point. Um, I'd like to tell you a bit about the discovery of gravitational waves because it's the moment where I had, uh, I think, my most profound experience of wonder as a scientist. Now, I can and sometimes do. In fact, yesterday evening, I was giving a whole hour lecture on gravitational waves. I will not do that today, but I'm going to give you the five minute version of uh, the lecture on gravitational waves. And first, what I want to do is show you all an animation of the process that the experiment I worked on, LIGO, discovered. We discovered about three years ago the collision of two black holes by sensing this new kind of information carrier, gravitational waves. And let me show you what we think happened, and then I will show you the evidence. So here's an animation showing two black holes rather close to each other in orbit around each other. This is slowed down so you can see what happened in the last few orbits. They're going around each other, making something that's propagating away. Those are our gravitational waves. You can see they're closer and faster, getting closer and faster. And all of a sudden, boom, they collide, making a new black hole, sending out stronger gravitational waves. Except from me that there is a phenomenon associated with that word gravitational waves. Uh, I will welcome questions really at any time, but for now, let me just show you how it was that we were able to sense that or what it meant for us to sense it. We spent decades building the world's most uh, sensitive mechanical uh, uh, telescopes to find the vibrations of space that were indicated by the green in that animation. And when we were all done on, most of the world calls it September 14th, 2015, but I like to think of it as Rosh Hashanah 5776, which meant my computer was closed. And I was the last person in the LIGO scientific collaboration to get this news. Um, here is what we heard from our gravitational wave telescope. You hear that? Hmm? Those vibrations of space that propagated away from those two black holes in their last few orbits, uh, and then when they collided, were picked up by the LIGO interferometers. Think of them as the world's best guitar pickup ever sensing the vibrations of the soundboard of space. And we heard the vibrations set up in space by the last few orbits of those two black holes and then their collision. I said that animation was slowed down so that you could uh, see what's going on. Those last few orbits all happened within a tenth of a second. 
which meant that all of those vibrations were happening at a pace so fast that if you turn them into sound by playing them through a speaker, they're in the human audio band. So we were literally hearing the shaking of the universe by that collision of two black holes. We waited a long time. We got the news on Rosh Hashanah 5776. Actually, it, the event happened 1.3 billion years earlier because the event was so far away, it took that amount of time for, uh, for the signal to reach us. So in case anyone thinks that as a religious believer, I take seriously that the universe maybe started 5,776 years ago, I hope I will disabuse you of, of that idea that's for, for how it. Um, now, I think that's kind of amazing, okay, actually. If that doesn't seem amazing enough to you, two black holes each weighing about 30 times the mass of the sun, going around each other uh, many times a second, uh, shaking space, let me tell you something about the energetics of that event. During the two tenths of a second where we could hear the vibration of space, that ripple of space that had propagated away from that collision uh, 1.3 billion light years away was carrying in it more energy during that two-tenth of a second duration that we could sense more energy than all of the stars in the universe combined had emitted during the same two-tenths of a second. The universe literally quaked. Now, when I first got this news, I will confess that I was mainly thrilled that a project that I had devoted close to four decades of my life and a thousand of my best friends had devoted decades of their lives to, and that you all, to the tune of about a billion dollars collectively, had supported for us and then been patiently waiting. But as the news sunk into me, it was less, seemed less important that we had succeeded and more important to me that we had been privileged to witness a truly awe-inspiring event. And I remember waking up one night a few weeks later, suddenly saying, the universe was shaking. And we, for the first time, were privileged to actually and um, I was so struck by that that I, I went to our rabbi, Andrew Pepperstone, of the synagogue, and I said, I've got to appropriately mark the, sig the significance of this event, not the scientific significance. We wrote a paper, we had a big press conference, that was fine. We knew how to do that. But as a human being responding uh, as a human being to this event, I wanted something else. And this was an easy one for our rabbi. He says, well, you know, in the back of our prayer book, we've got a list of 100 blessings, 100 brachot, and whenever you have an awe-inspiring experience, you're supposed to find the appropriate one and recite it. And sure enough, he said, um, there is an appropriate one. Blessed are you, Lord our God, sovereign of the universe, whose power and might fill the universe that one is supposed to say whenever one hears thunder. Okay? And this was thunder. This was better thunder than anyone else had ever heard in the history of the Jewish people. So I was very happy to learn that I should say that, that bracha, and on the Shabbat after our press conference, I had the opportunity to recite it in shul in, in front of um, our, my fellow congregants. So I feel like I've had, I've been privileged to have a personal experience of wonder at, at the universe. Um, but the, a question, a follow-up question that occurs to me um, and that question is this. 
as a scientist, you know, we like exploring the universe, we think that's important. Um, as a religious person, I wonder, is my scientific activity actually the best, the most profound, the most sensible kind of way of seeking a kind of knowledge that could lead us to God? And I had already been prepared to raise that question because for the past 15 years or so, I've been obsessively reading and rereading my favorite several books by Abraham Joshua Heschel, the great 20th century Jewish theologian. And he raises precisely this question, and in fact, gives a kind of an answer. And um, if there's one theme that will run both through this lecture and the other two, it is that, yes, indeed, there is some kind of connection um, between the feeling of wonder at the universe that all of us have, scientists have especially, or a specialized kind of version of it, but it's pretty universal. There's a connection between that and a way of approaching the universe in a non-scientific way that can be a way of opening our eyes and ears to the fact that the universe is more than just a mechanical system. And the way Heschel would have said it is the experience of wonder opens us to an encounter with God. Not, please, not that that sound that I just played for you all, that we were privileged to hear uh, with LIGO, is actually God speaking to us. Please don't hear me saying that. Instead, it's some kind of a wake-up call. Okay, I guess that was a dope slap. Okay? Um, a wake-up call to, all right, there is something going on, and we ought to pay attention. And I'd like to explore that idea um, with you all today. So um, Heschel uses actually a lot of words for wonder. It's such an important aspect of his thinking and his persuasive writing. And he was nothing if not a writer trying to be persuasive. He needs synonyms. So he says wonder, he says awe, he says radical amazement. And a few times, he actually uses the technical term from philosophy or aesthetics, the sublime. And his point is that if you're an awake human being, you recognize that from time to time, you have an encounter with the face of the universe that is not just its power and not just its beauty, although both of those are interesting and important, but this other aspect that the universe is sublime. And it's a great word, but it's a word that we don't use so much that I will just assume that everyone knows uh, what it means. So I went to the dictionary and looked up what the term sublime means, and I found two related definitions. One is um, something that is sublime evokes a feeling of smallness or being overpowered. And the other related idea, and it's interesting to think about how these two definitions uh, might work together, is that something that is sublime inspires awe or wonder because of beauty, nobility, or Heschel would have emphasized especially grandeur, greatness. It doesn't just mean bigness or powerfulness, but bigness or powerfulness or something in a way that suggests significance or importance. Okay? So let's keep the concept of the sublime with perhaps this dictionary help at thinking about it. And then I want to show you some images and ask you if they represent things that in, induce in you the emotion of the sublime. How about this one? Or that one. This is the so-called pillars of creation where new stars are being formed. 
or the Helix Nebula with that star in the process of dying. <coughs> Here's its atmosphere being blown off into space in an especially beautiful way. Or this spiral galaxy, the home to about 100 billion stars, including some newly formed in those red nebulae. Or maybe this other spiral galaxy oriented so we see it not face on like the last one, but edge on. This is my very favorite one, NGC 4565. I did my PhD dissertation on that galaxy. Or maybe these two galaxies, each home to 100 billion stars, flying so close to each other that their mutual gravity is tearing them apart. Destruction on a scale we can't even begin to fathom with our ordinary human way of thinking. Or maybe this collection of thousands of galaxies in a vast cluster. There's one giant one, another giant one, more ordinary sized ones. Almost every spot of light in this picture contains 100 billion stars. That's just one individual star in the way, in the Milky Way galaxy, blocking our view of this cluster of, of galaxies. So now I want to do a poll. Did you feel any emotions of the sublime, or wonder, or awe, or grandeur, or something when connecting with those, those pictures. OK to gesture. Carl does. OK, good. <laughs> yes, all right. Um, yeah, I hope so. I, I, I imagine that, that these are the sorts of things that, especially in the year 2018, but even for us old people here in this room, uh, we've been thinking about this for a while. These are the sorts of things that get to us. But you know, the idea of the sublime is been a part of human history since well before modern astronomy let us understand any of these things that I just showed you. So now I want to I want to ask, what about parts of nature closer to home? So it's going to be a it's going to be another um, question for you all. What do these things make me feel, and should I include those feelings in this concept of the sublime. So this thunderstorm at sea. There's, that could be a greeting card. Okay, are we getting any of those frissons of smallness, overpowered, inspiring awe or wonder because of beauty, nobility, or grandeur. Yes. yes. Okay. All right. So let's reflect. Let's reflect a bit. So I saw enough nodding of heads that I think we had a general amount of agreement that nature on the terrestrial scale is also capable, not just the cosmic scale, of evoking the feeling of the sublime. But now I want to turn it around and say, is it possibly the case that things our size might even be more powerful, more effective at evoking feelings of wonder than the astronomy pictures I started with. So ponder that. And the version that I want to put forward, as you might possibly agree, and I might try to induce you to agree with me, is that maybe the living things that I showed you in the last few slides, maybe those ought to be much more profound sources of wonder even than those titanic pictures of galaxies. So let's think about whether that might be, might be so. I want to show you an animation that I just go back to every now and again to get in touch with it. It's 
if I say the words, the BioVisions Project, has anyone in this room heard of it? Okay, a few of you all. I think it's amazing. So, those of you who nodded, great. Let's share for the other folks this animation. I won't play all three minutes, but it's, it's, it's well worth finding it on YouTube. This is supposed to represent the actions of tiny molecules. Well, for molecules, they're big ones. Some major proteins doing all sorts of stuff. And you medical folks probably understand a lot better than us physicists what we're seeing. But for everyone in the room, these are the molecular structures that make up the inner machinery of each of our cells. There are millions of proteins in each one of our cells and hundreds of billions of cells in our bodies. So as we sit watching this video, this stuff is happening an almost an uncountable number of times in our own bodies, enabling them to work for us. This is a, a different form of illustration of what goes on in a cell. This is a drawing of a particular uh, small cell uh, by my favorite biological illustrator, David Goodsell. And one thing I really like about his drawings, at least as, as an amateur, is he's really interested in knowing the actual functional shape of every protein in a cell and drawing them to scale, not just in their individual sizes, but with the right packing fraction. So you see how crowded is a cell with those various uh, macromolecules that do the stuff that make a cell, makes cells be alive and do what they need to do. So let me put out there my belief that the machinery of cells is awe-inspiring or a profound source of wonder. Do I get any assent um, to, to that? Okay, good. Now, I do believe that they're probably the, the more profound sources of wonder not because they are big or overpowering, it's the opposite, actually. <coughs> so this is a reinterpretation of the classical idea of the sublime. The ancient examples of the sublime were like a gigantic craggy mountain peak. Okay, we saw that big stuff works that way, but this small stuff, now that we're uncovering it, it's got nothing to do with size, it's complexity. I wrote the word design, but it can be in as many scare quotes as you want. Uh, the functionality, maybe, I should have said. Um, um, and the way that those living things, of which we are great examples, have the power to survive, to, uh, to reproduce, to modify their environment, I think they're much more impressive than mountains or even galaxies. Now, that's either a profound statement or not, but I'm not done, okay? Even, even if I've convinced you so, for, so, so far, I want to take this one step further. And to take it one step further, I want to remind everyone of some, philosophy, some history of philosophy that maybe we encountered somewhere in school or maybe not. And that's that an idea like this, or an idea that raises this question, has been around for millennia. There has been a, a, a theme running through the history of natural philosophy, 
that suggested that we could organize all the different parts of the world in which we live on a scale, the scale of nature uh, or the great chain of being, this has come to be rather out of favor, but there's still a survival of it in at least some representations of the living world in the form of the, tr the tree of life. And people who study biology learn both about the tree of life when they're young and then they learn how to not be so enamored of this concept later on, let me, let me suggest that. But here is a rather old diagram representing the full ancient idea of the great chain of being and We've got hell at the bottom and God in heaven surrounded by angels up at the top. Let's put that aside for a moment. That's maybe, that's not the, the nature part. We've got the elements, plant life, animal life, fish and birds, human beings. Here's Adam with Eve coming out of Adam's rib at this particular instant, but these are more contemporary people here. All right, and then we've got some angels and, and God up at the top. Or maybe these are saints and those are the angels. So non-living material things, material things that are kind of boring, material things that are more fun to look at, um, and human beings, so a gradation of excellence. More modern people are so embarrassed by what's at the bottom in these top few layers that we tended to excise it. And I learned in school something like this as a fact or an organizing principle of biology. This is uh, an evocative, not supposed to be very detailed example of the tree of life. Up at the top are human beings, other primates, but this is modern enough that some modern insects are at a different part of the top. Okay? We're, we're not trying to be chauvinists. We're not trying to be triumphalists. So we're not saying people are way up there and everything else is lower. But the idea of now the emphasis is on common descent from a simple ancestor. And here, I think what this is is supposed to be the world's most out of scale drawing of an amoeba representing the common ancestor of all the variety of living things. All right. So the idea has morphed quite a bit, but uh, you can still see the heritage of the great chain of being in its classical form. But now I will try not to embarrass myself in front of people who know a lot more about living things than I do. Here is what, here is, what a more modern version of the tree of life looks like. <coughs> Still called the tree of life in this popular website where I found it, but it doesn't look anything like a tree anymore because people are, for a mixture of good and maybe not such good reasons, embarrassed to say some things are higher, some forms of life are higher than others. But we still like the idea of the branchingness of a tree to represent what we are trying to figure out about descent from ancestors and when one line of living things branched off from another line. So common ancestor is supposed to be there in the center and then things radiate out and the current forms are all displayed around the outside and Let's see. So the red part is animals. Oh, here in very tiny font that I can read, but probably most of the this says, you are here. OK, so we've really gone all out to say, no, people are nothing special. All right, We're a kind of modern life form, but we uh, have relationships with these other animals and just slightly more different, distant relationship with fungi. Okay, so. 
I have zero problem with this with a, as a representation of biological fact as best we're able to, uh, to, to represent it. But I want to question whether we haven't gone for the point of view not of representing biological facts, but for the point of view of trying to understand our world in the most profound and complete way that we can as complete human beings, maybe we've gone too far in expunging the idea of higher or lower forms of life from our representation of how the living world is organized. And I want to claim some support in this uh, critique that I'm making from a really excellent but too poorly known 20th century philosopher, Hans Jonas, who is not a religious fundamentalist or any kind of a nut. He's a very successful but obscure philosopher. He was a founder of the philosophy of biology, and anyone who might, thinks they might be interested will be very well rewarded by getting a hold of his copy, The Phenomenon of Life. And he's also known as one of the founders of green thinking. Uh, his book, The Imperative of Responsibility, is thought of by many European greens as one of the Bibles of the green movement. And let me share with you all uh, what I think is one of Jonas's main ideas. And I've got some slides with text, but the key text where I've got a slide that's full of words that are blur are on your source sheets. So is there anyone who is here who did not get a source sheet? OK. Um, those of you who have it, let's look at source number one from page two of Hans Jonas's The Phenomenon of Life. And um, Becca, could I ask you to read this very first quote? That's a beautiful poetic sentence. Thank you for that nice reading. But notice, the thing I want you to, to notice is that Jonas was unembarrassed. In fact, he put this on page two, the very beginning of his book, unembarrassed to say the manifold of existing life presents itself as an ascending scale. That's unpopular today, but maybe Jonas is on the way to making it popular again. Notice, though, also how he described the ascending scale. He didn't say an ascending scale of one-celled animals and then uh, plants and then animals and then primates and then humans. He said an ascending scale of, and read this, from the bottom up, because it's an ascending scale. Sophistication of form, lure of sense, spur of desire, command of limb, powers to act, reflection of consciousness, and reach for truth. So what he's doing is saying, OK, some living things do all of this. Some living things, we admire them because David Goodsell can draw a drawing that shows you where every molecule is in that cell, and that's amazing. But some things are better at sensing and then seeking out things that they need based on what they sense. Some have more facility at interacting with the world, at propelling their bodies, at doing even more interesting things than just swimming around and getting food. Powers to act beyond motion. Act is a much more abstract verb, and now up at the top, reflection of consciousness and reach for truth, you say, wait a minute. Don't be so convinced that the only interesting thing is the branching of our lineages. Don't be so interested in that that we forget 
that at the end of the day, no sensible person would deny that some activities that human beings engage in are special. And not just special in the accidental sense that other creatures don't do them as far as no, at least, but special in the sense of having value. Being able to be scientists, among many other noble human activities, right, is something that we don't share with any other parts of the living world. Being, and I didn't mean to privilege just scientists, but I was just speaking, giving a science talk last night, so got to switch modes. Um, this is special. This is valuable. This is in the true meaning that we can share of an old-fashioned word. This is higher. So. I would go so far as to say that what Jonas is doing is asking us to reinterpret what the sublime really ought to mean. And he's making the point that things at the top of the chain of being are more worthy of respect, wonder, awe, amazement, um, whichever. Uh, whichever word works works best for you. So I think this is an interesting claim, but it's also interesting in that it links up with maybe less specifically articulated uh, versions of this idea from our ancient religious traditions. And here is a very famous verse from the first book of the Bible, that God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Whatever else this verse should or should not be taken to mean, what it is surely intending us to take away is that we have a special kind of close relationship to God. And it should seem obvious in the sense that we are and do in fact have much more special abilities and powers than any other thing in the universe. So Jonas is doing it for us in the 20th and now 21st centuries, but we have roots of our thinking that goes way back. So if you look around you in this room, and I'd like you to look around at the people sitting next to you, or maybe even behind you, in some sense, we are supposed to take this as actually seeing, in some sense of the word, and figuring it out, what the sense is, is really important, images of God. And keeping, at least from time to time, sometimes in a department meeting, I don't want to think of that person sitting next to me as an image of God, it's pretty hard. But um, more seriously though, uh, this kind of awareness is actually important to cultivate. And what I'd like to do now is move from the, I hope you've seen the arc of this talk, from the scientific specifically through a question of what kinds of values can we uh, use to organize our scientific knowledge, and now say specifically some things that are religious or and or value laden, but informed by this kind of thinking about the world. And my hero in my religious life and also my hero for purposes of this talk and the next two that I'll give is the great 20th century Jewish theologian Abraham Joshua Heschel. My favorite picture of him, but easily find many others. Um, and He's like a man from two worlds. He was born and grew up as a very uh, young man in the vast Jewish neighborhoods of pre-war Warsaw. He was descended from the best lineage of Hasidic rabbis you could imagine, and was brought up with the assumption that he would be their successor. But as a very young man, he seems to have 
taken on the personal mission in life to bring the uh, most profound insights of the Jewish tradition in which he'd been educated to people who had fallen away by virtue of being brought up in the modern world and instead of in the Hasidic world. And he went to a secular European gymnasium for his high school education and then went to the University of Berlin where he earned a PhD and spent and I think that was deliberate choice because he knew he had to learn to speak the language of the modern world even while carrying with him this heritage in which he was brought up. He escaped the Holocaust just barely. Most of his family was not so lucky. He ended with spending most of his adult career at the Jewish Theological Seminary where Rabbi Jazer was privileged, or maybe not, you tell us later, <laughs> to have studied with him. Um, and Heschel's legacy is available to uh, those of us who lived after he passed away through a number of books that he wrote, and the three most accessible ones of those are two from 1951, The Sabbath and Man is Not Alone, and a sequel to Man is Not Alone that may be his most important work, God in Search of Man, 1955. So if anyone wants some for further reading, here's the for further reading uh, part of the talk. But let me explain what I take Heschel to have been saying. Now, um, here is um, in another uh, quote that you have on your source sheet, number two. Brenda, would you be able to read number two for us? No one can sneer at the stars, mock the dawn, ridicule the outburst of the spring, or scoff at the totality of being. Standing between heaven and earth, we are silence. Okay. So Heschel's working on the turf that we've been talking about. You know. What kinds of feelings do you have when you see a beautiful night sky or see the sunrise or have a, you know, a chance to uh, uh, welcome the spring? That's hard to picture right today. Um, or scoff at the totality of being. No one can scoff at it. Um, how about source three? Mark, can you do that? There is so much more meaning in our reality than the soul can take in. To our sense of mystery and wonder, the world is too incredible, too meaningful for us, and its existence the most unlikely, the most unbelievable fact, contrary to all reasonable expectations. Even our ability to wonder fills us with amazement. Yeah, even or maybe read especially our ability to wonder fills us with amazement. And how about this quote? Mireille, would you be able to read this? Yes. What there is there to all of reality, not only to what we <coughs> see, but also the very act of seeing as well, as to our own self, to the self that we see and are the that The most incomprehensible fact is the fact that we comprehend the self. Yeah. All right. See, we're seeing the drift of Heschel's thought. He wants to awaken us, first of all, with what everyone agrees is wonder inspiring, those beautiful sights of the heavens, of the earth, but is taking us in the same kind of direction as say, for example, Hans Jonas. Now, I'm struck by this. I'm struck by how much it lines up with Hans Jonas's uh, explicit statement. But as a physicist, I have to say, I've heard Einstein say almost the same thing. And what astonished me not so long ago when I encountered this is that even the world's most famous smart aleck physicist, Richard Feynman, 
and I think he wore that badge proudly, actually think something rather similar. So this is a this is a slightly longer quote, but Jerry, if you were up, you can. Alan, could you read source five? <clears throat> Is that amazing or what? Okay. The most smart alecky physics chauvinist physicist of the 20th century confesses that when he really thinks about the universe, he starts with atoms, where he lived his day job, but then very quickly gets to the point where he's saying, all right, we think of ourselves as being made of atoms, and we are literally actually made out of atoms. So we're made out of matter, and yet we are collections of atoms who have this special property that can wonder and can wonder why it wonders. And this takes you so far out of the standard easy to fall into fully materialist view of the world that Feynman is kind of embarrassed to admit it, but really is saying, but you know, this is really what I think, and I don't know what to make of it. And maybe it's a religious experience, but it's not the religion I was brought in. I was brought up with some really dumb religious ideas that are, of course, silly, and so I can't adhere to them, but maybe there is a more profound way of thinking religious thoughts that does justice to the amazingness of the world. And if we get ourselves in that frame of mind, that's a kind of religion that could actually help us make sense of the world. And just don't get hung up on the dumb Bible stories you were taught, you know, in Sunday school as a kid that were dumbed down for kids. Every profound religious thinker knows that they had to dump things down for kids. The trouble is most of us turn our backs on it as soon as we're no longer kids and we don't get the good stuff. Feynman had to reinvent it for himself. But when he did, he was kind of excited and shocked and in awe of, um, of that experience. Okay. Um, now, I found another passage of Heschel's that you can read um, as a rejoinder to Feynman, but of course he wrote it some, some years before. Um, Rabbi, would you read six and seven for us, please? This then is an insight we gain in acts of wonder, not to measure meaning in terms of our own mind, but to sense a meaning infinitely greater than ourselves. Wonder is not a synonym for the unknown, but rather a name for a meaning which stands in relation to God. So in this dialogue I've constructed between these thinkers, I think there's a lot of interaction of what I find to be pretty profound ideas, and I'll, I'll say it outright, a more productive and um, enlightening way of approaching the world than the, um, the, the, the strictly materialist view that I was 
brought up with implicitly, if not explicitly, because I think my teachers of science were kind of even too embarrassed to explicitly try to argue for a physical only, material only worldview. They just took it as obvious. But Heschel, Feynman, Jonas are all saying, no, wake up, think, think more profoundly about the world. So let me summarize what, what I have tried to convince you of, and it will be an interesting uh, thing for us all to ponder, how, how convincing that was. Um, I learned from Heschel to respect the role that wonder plays even in science, but also in the human response to the natural world. And even more importantly, Heschel taught me that wonder can be taken as the entrance to the path from the world we live in towards God. And he points out that wondering, our capacity to wonder is the most wonderful thing. And as I'm really thrilled to have discovered, even a physicist of Feynman's qualities agrees as long as you let him say, well, I never was given a religion sophisticated enough to help me through this, but may maybe we need one. Um, so uh, I'd like to now just do a little bit of advertising. Let me advertise that there will be two other lectures in this series, one on uh, two related topics of time and consciousness and how I think that they are wedges that split apart the seeming solidity of the uh, purely physicalist worldview and how my reading of some resources from Abraham Joshua Heschel helped me to uh, uh, feel that there's a more profound understanding than what's on offer. Um, in science or philosophy departments. And then in the third lecture, and the dates and times I will mention in a moment, but they're also on the yellow sheet that you probably picked up, or if not, you should pick up on the way out. In the third lecture, I will do an explicit close reading of one paragraph from Heschel's 1955 book, God in Search of Man, where I will try to convince all of you who are in the audience, that Heschel is actually proposing a novel argument for the existence of God in two sentences, actually trying to convince you, not just, oh man, this is so cool, but that there actually is a reason to start from these kinds of thoughts and say, you know what? The idea that our world is not just us and things below us on the great chain of being, but something above us on the great chain of being to which the word God can sensibly apply is a more profound and useful view of the world. That's the burden of my lecture number three. So I hope some of you all can be there. Here are the places and times. That's all that information is on the yellow sheet, so I won't dwell on this slide. But now let me, without trying to put anyone on the spot, sort of give a friendly glance to the young people um, who I don't recognize from being, who, as members of Congregation Beth Shalom Kabrishas, if this is at all interesting enough, or if even if this wasn't interesting enough, you're curious enough about the kinds of issues that this talk is about, Please don't be shy about giving your name and email or cell phone number so that we can reach out to you in case you want to be connected with a mentor who might help you through any kind of reading project that you all would want to set up on this or other topics uh, related to science and religion. So uh, with that, I'll close my monopolizing of, of the sound in the room and open it up to questions that you may have. Thanks for your attention. Brenda. Um, since we're in this building, because Kelly Mark, as we walk down here, I spent a ton of time in 
between 1998 and 2009 working in a program on teaching communication skills to medical students. But unfortunately, my starter, Steve Harris Jr., the son of the entertainer, was head of, he was a family doc, it was a fabulous program, and, um, and then it had changed a lot for a lot of reasons by the time I left it. So you're working with medical students who are then going to work with people. And then the other part of my thing, since we're in this building, is all the years I spent working in nursing homes and talking about wonder of life, trying to figure out as you're walking around with someone so demented they don't know their feet from their head, and you're talking to them about drinking beer or whatever you're talking about, made no sense. And so the wonder of life in, in terms of medicine, which has been turned on its ear because our medical system is now so constrained by so many things between lack of doctors, lack of nurses, lack of money, lack of everything, that the wonder of the patient is gone in most instances. So I think this is a terrific program. And if the other still exists, it would be a great thing for them to take on. Thank you for that. Other comments or questions? Miriam. Wonder. It's a big word. There is something here. There is a, a person who came to see a pure wonder. And he used it for some human being at the same time. And that's what we meant when we did. I had this experience. Uh, not being gracious in the slightest little bit. But when I saw the lipids was, uh, I was so non-existent at that time. And feeling just pure wonder that I had a mystical experience. And it became a spa. Climbing into nothingness. And uh, He's a scientist, right? Yeah. 